And now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Keith Moore. Now, I may consume quite a bit of your time if I want to tell you all about Dr. Keith Moore. However, uh, briefly, Dr. Moore is the uh, Dean of the College of Medicine at the University of Toronto in Canada. He is a professor of embryology, has been professor for 20 years in uh, the University of uh, Manitoba in Winnipeg, and uh, he has been uh, the chairman of the department for 11 years. Dr. Moore has written about six, seven books actually, four books in embryology, one in neuro, neuroanatomy, and two in gross anatomy. Uh, Dr. Moore is a fellow of International Academy of Psychology. He is the president of the Association of American Association of Clinical Anatomists. And uh, he is his uh, books are being taught. Uh, in the medical schools throughout the world, not only in this country or Canada, but throughout the world. And his research in the embryology field is uh, very outstanding. I believe that you will find it so when we listen to Dr. Moore. May we welcome Dr. Moore. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, when I was first called about attending this uh, meeting, uh, I didn't think it was going to be possible for me to do so, but I didn't realize at the time that it was a student's association that was inviting me here. Had I known that, I probably would have accepted right away because I get a lot of invitations from students, uh, groups, uh, across the United States, and I try to accept as many of those invitations as I can. So uh, I want to tell you about uh, some uh, studies that uh, I and others have done uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, I first became aware of the uh, Quran about 10 years ago when I visited Saudi Arabia. Uh, at the invitation of King Abdulaziz University to lecture in embryology. And at that time I was asked about some of the, the meaning of some of the verses in the Quran, and uh, I tried to uh, interpret them as best I could. And that really started a, a study which has lasted for about 10 years in a part-time way. And uh, I've, I've been happy to uh, tell people about uh, these uh, uh, findings because it's been very uh, inspiring to me because I've already always been interested in the history uh, of uh, embryology uh, and some of the early history is not very well known to us. Now I'm going to uh, follow my notes uh, fairly closely so that uh, uh, I won't talk too long. So I want to start then with the historical background and uh, the first uh, scientific studies in embryology, as far as we know, were uh, done by the uh, Greek uh, scientists in the 5th century BC. Uh, Hippocrates, who we know as the father of medicine and uh, after whom the Hippocratic Oath is named, uh, was one of the first to write books on embryology. And later, Aristotle, another famous Greek philosopher and scientist, studied chick embryos, actually opened eggs and was able to study the uh, development, concluded at that time, and this is uh, 4th and 5th century BC, that man's development, that is human development, was similar to that of the chicken. The writings of Aristotle and Galen, another uh, scientist, dominate the early part of, the, of our historical record. And from the time of Galen, around 200 AD, until the 16th century, no major advances in our knowledge of embryology were recorded in the literature 
of Western science. This is mainly because these kind of studies were forbidden in those very dark ages. Consequently, as far as we know, until the revelations in the Quran, man was relatively ignorant about his reproduction and development. It was not until the invention of the microscope in the 17th century that any significantly new information was added to the field of embryology. Uh, before this uh, time, the fetus was said to develop from a coagulum of human uh, blood and, and the seed. There's really no idea of how we developed, but in the days of Aristotle, they believed, as uh, Sheikh uh, Mustafa Ahmed said, that menstrual blood was the uh, thought to give rise to the embryo and that the, uh, they really didn't know anything about uh, spermatozoa or sperms. But when the uh, microscope was uh, discovered, if we could have that first uh, slide. Now, these early microscopes were very primitive by uh, our standards today. Uh, this first slide, I don't know whether they're going to, can you see those? Well, that, that's a picture of Aristotle there. Uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, writers in, in human embryology. Maybe the microscope could come on. Yeah, this is the uh, microscope that was invented uh, by Leeuwenhoek uh, in 1694. And this is a very uh, crude microscope. As you can see, the object, whatever it was you were looking at, was put on the end of a needle point, and uh, there was a small magnifying glass, and you would look at this, but uh, it didn't give very uh, uh, much magnification. It would be equivalent to what you would get now if you used a magnifying glass. So it wouldn't give very much uh, enlargement. So this is the, the state of, of uh, knowledge uh, in uh, the 17th century, and uh, it would not be possible for them to uh, see the uh, early stages of human development even at that uh, time. Now. Uh, when they did see what they thought was a sperm, uh, they thought that this uh, sperm, and if we could just have, they, they visualized this sperm with a little imagination that inside that sperm or male germ cell was a little human being. And all it needed was for it to be implanted in the female and in the environment of the mother's uterus, this would stimulate this little person to start uh, developing. And so the real role of the uh, female then was to give this uh, little embryo a place to develop and to stimulate it. Now I should say in fairness there were others who believed uh, that uh, the female ovary, the oocytes or eggs, they contained the little human being. So there was two groups. One said the little human being was in a sperm, others said it was in the oocyte or egg, and that, that when they uh, started to develop then this little person just got bigger. So that shows you what our knowledge was like in uh, the 17th century. The fact that the sperm and the ovum were necessary for conception was not known until the 18th century uh, when there were further refinement, refinements in our optical uh, instruments and microscopes were better developed and so on. And so they were actually able to see the uh, sperm and the egg and realized then uh, that they actually came together in a process which was called uh, fertilization. Now later in the development in embryology, uh, they developed the idea of stages. Uh, and the first attempts to arrange human embryos in stages were made towards the end of the 19th century. And these efforts continued during the early part of the 20th century. In 1914, uh, Dr. Moll in this country arranged 266 human embryos in a series of stages. 28 years later, Dr. Streeter, also of the United States, classified human embryos in 23 stages, which he called developmental horizons. Now, Streeter's classifications were used worldwide until 1973, when Dr. Ronan O'Reilly who's at uh, University of San Diego, developed a more detailed system for classifying human embryos, particularly during the first three weeks of development. Now, these Carnegie stages, that is named after the Carnegie Institute of Embryology, 
uh, have received international approval and are based on very various uh, developmental events and morphological criteria. And these uh, timetables of human development are, are from my book, which I developed uh, in uh, about 1970, uh, based on the uh, Carnegie stages of human development. And uh, at this time, when I did these uh, stages, I had no uh, awareness that there was anything about human development in the uh, Quran. So uh, it's only then in the last uh, uh, 15 to 20 years that we've had a good knowledge of the stages of human development. Now this uh, knowledge has increased rapidly in the last few years. Now a na major difficulty in the classification of terminology is the fact that the shape of the embryo is continuously changing. The principles for nomenclature and for uh, terminology for descriptive embryology are the terms that are applied to a particular development which would be descriptive of what the embryo really looks like. There should also be full agreement between the term uh, and the nature of the development and events occurring at that stage. In order to avoid confusion, each term should define a stage which has a clear beginning and an end as is possible in order to avoid any overlap between stages or on the other hand to avoid any gaps between one stage and another. Now, uh, it was about this time that I began to study the uh, Quran and to look at verses referring to embryology. So I found that there was a, a, a large uh, terminology in the Quran referring to human development. Now, uh, as they, until uh, recently, it was not known that this holy book of the Muslims uh, and the Sunnah or Hadith, the teachings of Muhammad, contained many citations referring to the stages of human development. Until recently, these statements were not clearly understood, since they referred to details in development which were not scientifically, which were scientifically unknown in earlier times. In fact, the Islamic system for classifying human embryos is amazingly uh, is amazing since it was recorded in the 7th century AD. Although Aristotle, as I mentioned before, the founder of the science of embryology, realized that chick embryos developed in stages from uh, uh, hen's eggs in the 4th century, he did not give any details about these stages. Also, the early human embryo is of such a minute size that uh, detailed studies would have been impossible without the microscope. Uh, in the very early stages of human development, the first few days, uh, it's so small that you could just barely see it. Uh, in other words, it's about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. And you could realize how without our modern microscopes, you would not be able to see any of those details of the early stages. Now, as far as we know from the history, history of embryology, little was known about the staging and classification of human embryos until the last hundred years, as, as I've just mentioned. Moreover, the Quranic terminology fulfills the principles for nomenclature and terminology. For this reason, the descriptions of human embryos in the Quran cannot be based on scientific knowledge in the seventh century. The only reasonable conclusion that is that these descriptions were revealed to Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, by God. He could not have known such details because he was an illiterate man. He was not a scientist or an embryology, and he did not have scientific training. Now, in the following passages from the Quran, we introduce the concept of stages in human development. And uh, this uh, first verse was the first one that was shown to me. Uh, and uh, you can read that uh, there. Uh, God created man from a quintessence of uh, clay. Uh, he then uh, placed him in, as a nutfa, a droplet, in a place of uh, settlement, firmly fixed. Then we make the nutfa into a nalika, a leech-like structure, and then uh, he changed the nalika into a mudga, a chewed-like uh, substance. Uh, then we made out of that mudga uh, isam, I can't read too well here, skeleton, and then we clothed the bones with muscles. Uh, then we caused him to grow, and then we came into uh, bone, 
into being and attain the definitive the human form, uh, so blessed be God, uh, the best to create. This is from one of the uh, surahs. So, uh, and uh, we have the next uh, one, I believe, that shows this is the Islamic. Now, this are, are the stages that uh, we found in the Quran, and it's taken uh, a lot of study and discussion to uh, arrive at the meaning of these stages. The first one is the nutfa or the drop stage, and then the, the second is the clock, or shaping stage, and then the nasha, or the growth stage. Now the proposed system is clear, it's comprehensive, and conforms with uh, uh, present embryological uh, knowledge. Uh, and it's our hope that this terminology can be introduced uh, internationally, but if, uh, if nothing more, at least the Muslim uh, science students uh, can realize that uh, the stages that we talk about uh, in our embryology textbooks uh, are, are the same, it's just that they have different names. Now the uh, principles for the terminology then, that they be descriptive of appearance and that they re reflect the processes occurring and that they be uh, avoid uh, ambiguous uh, beginning and an end. In other words, uh, they should be clear as to what these stages uh, refer to. And uh, this was the, actually the first verse that was ever read to me when I was in Quran, or in uh, Saudi Arabia, and I'd never, uh, I knew that the Quran existed, but I'd never uh, read it uh, before. And uh, when they asked me what this uh, verse uh, meant to me, I said, well, it was obvious it makes you in the womb, wombs of your mother, which is the uterus, of course. Uh, womb is simply uh, an English translation of the Latin uterus. Uh, in your mother's in stages. So here is talking about uh, stages, which is similar to what uh, uh, Hippocrates and uh, Aristotle had talked about, one after another in three veils of darkness. Uh, then I was asked what this three veils of darkness might be, and uh, it occurred to me uh, that uh, it might be, as I've indicated here in these slides, that the first veil of darkness around this developing human would probably be the anterior abdominal wall, that is the skin, muscles, and so on, around the uh, uh, mother, uh, forming the wall, anterior wall of the mother's abdomen. Two, I thought, would be the wall of the uterus, the, the uh, organ which contains the embryo, and then inside that uterus we have other membranes which we call the amnion and the chorion, and we combine that because they fuse together, we call it the amniochorionic membrane. Now this was my initial interpretation of this, and I've heard many different other interpretations of what these veils of darkness are, and I don't suppose we will ever know exactly what those, that verse meant, uh, but this interpretation has been accepted by uh, some of the prominent uh, embryologists around the world. And I have invited my friends, uh, as mentioned, Dr. Johnson from Jefferson Medical College, Dr. Brassad from Winnipeg, Dr. Edwards from Cambridge, who some of you remember uh, Steptoe and Edwards. Dr. Edwards uh, were the first ones to produce a, a baby in vitro, and uh, little Louise uh, Brown uh, was the first one. And Dr. Uh, Edwards agreed with our interpretations uh, of this. So, uh, and then we went on and studied other verses. Uh, well, this this uh, shows the description of the mother and the relationship of the mother to the conceptus. Conceptus is simply the uh, developing embryo plus the membranes that are around it. Uh, and uh, that is the uh, nutva. Uh, is the related to the is the conceptus and uh, these other uh, stages referring to the uterus and so on. These are all terms that are in the Quran. And we then uh, placed him as a nutfa or a drop in a place of settlement firmly fixed. Uh, when I was asked what this would mean, I obviously thought of the uh, settlement or implantation of the uh, early human embryo, which we call a blastocyst, into the uh, lining of the uh, uterus. Uh, 
The uh, nutva uh, stage involves the sperm and the ovum and their union to form the fertilized zygote, uh, the cell division to form the blastocyst and the implantation into the uterus. Now the shaping stage is further divided into alaka, as I mentioned, mudka, islam, and lam stages. During the latter part of this stage, the embryo also develops a human appearance and undergoes a straightening of its bodily form. The growth stage includes what is now known as the fetal uh, period of human development, involves modification in the bodily proportions, the development of the individual appearances or features, and the growth and refinement of the various uh, organ stages. Now we look at the nutva stage, which is the initial stage, which is what in ordinary embryology we would call the zygote. Uh, the word nutva means a small amount of fluid or a drop of it. As the first stage is called the nutva, it includes five phases or substages which involve the mixing of male and female germinal fluids, fertilization, implantation, and early cell division. And so we'll deal then with the phases of the nutva. And the first is the mani. It's been uh, discovered that the uh, first stage is formed from a part of the male fluid, that is the nutva of the father, which includes the sperm, and part of the female fluid, fluid which is the nutva of the mother, which includes the ovum. Now the Arabic term mani is used mainly to describe the sperm, although it is also used to describe both the sperm and the ovum. During the fertilization process, the male fluid travels from the vagina uh, up through the uterus and meets the female fluid in the uh, uterine tube or oviduct, or as some people call it, the fallopian tube. According to the Islamic statements, fertilization does not occur from all of the fluids, from the male and the female, but from a minute portion of them. As the Quran uh, states, was he not a uh, drop of germinal fluid, mani, emitted? And mani here refers to the sperm and the ovum. Other components of the male and female fluids uh, aid in the fertilization process. The semen, that is the mixture of, of sperms and fluids, uh, contain uh, hormones called prostaglandins which induce the uterine contractions and they may aid in the transport of the sperm to the fertilization site. Important components of the, male, of the female fluid also contribute to this process. During the female fertile phase of the woman's menstrual cycle, the cervical mucus, which is otherwise fairly impervious to sperm, becomes clear and gel-like through a realignment of its molecules and allows the sperms to pass. Enzymes secreted by the linings of the uterus and the oviducts capacitate, that is, they remove a, a, a covering from the sperm, but, uh, which are called glycoproteins, and this enables it to then participate in fertilization. Sperms are unable to fertilize ova unless they've been capacitated. Additionally, enzymes are secreted by the oviducts, which loosen the follicular cells surrounding the ovum and expose its protective membrane to the sperm. The fact that the fluids of the male and the female are involved with fertilization was mentioned in the following hadith. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, was asked by a Jewish person, O Muhammad, what is man created from? The Prophet answered, O Jew, he is created from both, from the fluid of the man and the fluid of the woman. Thus the word nutva used in the Hadith is a very comprehensive term. Now the next term is called sulala. Uh, this refers to the selection from the male and the female fluids as the following passage uh, mentions. Not from all uh, fluid is the offspring uh, created. And when I was uh, asked uh, about this, I explained that, uh, that uh, when we develop, we only develop from a small portion. Uh, th thus, uh, the creation from both fluids occurs through a special selection. The creanic term for this selection is sulala, which means in Arabic, gentle extraction from fluid. 
It is now known that both the ovum and the sperm are gently extracted from their environments in the process of fertilization. The ovum is selected from a long stream of follicular fluid, follicular fluid, while one sperm out of millions is selected from the seminal fluid. The first sperm which touches the cell membrane of the ovum enters easily, but immediately afterwards a rapid change occurs in the cell membrane, selecting that sperm only, and all other sperm, sperms are locked out. Now, talk again about the nutva or nutva amsha. The fertilized ovum, or zygote as we call it, takes the form of a drop, uh, or a nutva amsha, which is a drop of mingled fluid. As God says in the Quran, we created man from a, do a drop of mingled fluid, that is the nutva amsha. An important point with regard to this phrase is the fact that nutva is a singular noun while amsha is a plural modifying adjective. According to the conventional rules of grammar, singular nouns are normally modified by singular adjectives, and thus the term nutva amshad was a mystery to early Quranic scholars. However, this peculiarity in the language can now be explained since we now know that the zygote remains singular as a nutva, while internally the chromosomes and other contributions from the sperm and ovum form a plural mixture described as amshad. Therefore, from a scientific point of view, Amshad is entirely accurate as a plural adjective modifying the singular nutva, which is really a multifaceted entity, single entity. This stage continues in development, maintaining the shape of the nutva, but dividing it into smaller and small, smaller cells called blastomeres. Uh, until about four days later, it uh, forms a spherical mass of cells known as a morula. Five days after fertilization, the nutva then forms a blastocyst as the morula cells separate into two parts. During this time, the term amsha uh, very appropriately applies to the nutva in all of its developments, since it continues to be a, a multifaceted entity. Uh, the next stage is called uh, takdir. In the early formation of the nutva amsha, the chromosomes form from both parents, and they uh, mix, and uh, that is what gives rise to the uh, human embryo. This genetic mixture will determine the characteristics of the child as well, well as the child's sex. As the Quran mentions, he created him from nutva, and immediately laid down the plan or the program of his future development. He created him, uh, then uh, agrees completely with our understanding. We know that the chromosomes from the mother and the father uh, unite at fertilization, and that we are then a mixture of the chromosomes of our uh, mothers and, and fathers. And that this is all determined uh, at this uh, very early stage of nutva. And uh, we didn't understand that until uh, probably about uh, in the 1920s. Now the last stage of this uh, early development is called hearth. In the last phase of the nutva amsha, the blastocyst implants into the endometrium or the uh, lining of the uterus. Uh, this uh, passage uh, from the Quran states, Your wives are a tilth or a hearth unto you, so approach your tilth when or how you will. Uh, tilth or hearth refers to cultivation of the soil. So it's clear that the, an understanding of the lining of the uterus or what we call the endometrium was very much like soil, that when the blastocyst implants, it gets its nourishment from the mother's blood just as a plant, roots of a plant, get its nourishment uh, from the soil. The last step of the nutva stage begins with implantation of the blastocyst and is called the hearth phase. The, the Quran considers this process analogous to the cultivation of the soil and the lining of the uterus like soil in which the seed develops. Indeed, the blastocyst embeds and roots itself into the endometrium with cells which will eventually form the placenta, just as the seed embeds itself in the soil. Uh, this uh, shows the uterus at the top, 
and the red area, which is blown up in the bottom, is the lining of the endometrium of the uterus, into which the blastocyst, or early human embryo, implants, and it gets its nourishment from those uh, uh, blood vessels uh, and mother's blood, which carries the oxygen and nutrient substances uh, to it. And, and the, the comparison then to uh, a seed developing in the soil is a very uh, accurate one. So that the uh, development and the structural changes which occur during the nutva stage are virtually impossible to detect without a microscope due to the minute size of the uh, nutva. And if we look at the next uh, pictures there, I guess that's the end of that uh, portion. Uh, so this is the uh, first part of my uh, presentation, and uh, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, so thank you very much. And next we'll deal with uh, the shaping st stage, which is called Kalk, K-H-A-L-Q. Uh, and uh, the first part of that is the Alica stage. The, this uh, second or shaping stage begins as the Alica, which is an Arabic word meaning a leech. And when I was first asked about this, did the human embryo look like a leech? And when I thought about this for a few minutes, I realized that it uh, resembled the leech very closely, as you will uh, see. During the early stage, the embryo loses its rounded shape and elongates and until it takes the shape of a leech. And this uh, picture here, uh, I went over to our library and got out a book on leeches and uh, had my artist draw that exactly from the textbook showing a leech. And here is a, a human embryo uh, here, uh, and they're on the 21, 22 days. And I think you have to agree that they look very much alike. In fact, you see that the leech has segments, just like a worm, and the human embryo has, uh, has the, these same segments. In fact, we still have a remnant of those segments in our bodies. If any of you have ever had shingles, ever heard of anyone having shingles, you always get the eruptions and, and bands across the area that's infected. And those bands are the remnants of those uh, segments. So this is uh, what I believe to be the, the leech-like appearance of the human embryo. Uh, the, uh, and I believe in my descriptions in my book, I talk about it having a leech-like appearance. The similarity between the, the embryo and a leech is amazing. The embryo is attached to the wall of the chorion, the chorionic sac, which is attached by chorionic villi to the endometrium or lining of the uterus. Uh, and so the human embryo is attached to the lining of the uterus, just like a leech will attach to your skin. I don't know whether you have leeches here or not, but we have certain lakes in Canada. If you go in swimming, these leeches will attach to your skin and suck the blood. So the analogy there is, is quite uh, uh, amazing. Uh, initially, the embryo acquires a primitive circulatory and nervous system during this early stage. That's the term alica. It refers to the leech-like external appearance of the embryo as, a well as, as well as to its clinging relationship to the uterus and is an appropriately descriptive term for this stage. Another meaning mentioned by the interpreters for alica is similar to a blood clot. Uh, and, and the external appearance of the embryo during this phase is similar to that of blood due to the appearance of the primitive heart and the cardiovascular system. If you look at the picture at the bottom, it shows a, an embryo of about uh, 22 or 23 days. And uh, the bottom is the yolk sac and the embryo is the part of the top and you see all these blood vessels and if you were to see an embryo at that stage and I should say that uh, uh, most embryos uh, will undergo spontaneous abortion at about this stage in other words when they were two or three weeks old uh, they will often uh, spontaneously abort that means that they just are expelled from the mother's uterus uh, without a, a known cause although we've done a lot of studies on this and find that many of them have very abnormal uh, chromosomes and they couldn't have survived if they had lived. 
So uh, as we used to say in the old days, this was God's way of ridding uh, the body of something that was very abnormal. But anyway, we do know that they are aboard at this early stage and uh, they do look like a clot of blood because when they pull away from the uterus, then you have all these uh, exposed uh, blood vessels which have a bloody appearance. So this explains one interpretation for Alica as a blood clot. I prefer the, the one being a leech-like structure. Uh, now the blood does not circulate until the end of the third week. But on the 21st day, the heart of the embryo connects with blood vessels in the embryo, the connecting stock and the chorion, and the blood starts to circulate, as you, you could see in this diagram in the bottom. Thus, the embryo takes the appearance of a blood clot, even though its blood is fluid. And these features incorporate the other meaning of a blood clot for the alica phase. Now, the next stage is the mudga stage. And again, when I was asked what this meant, it says, uh, I, it reminded me of an embryo at this stage. And uh, when I was told that the mudka meant a chewed substance, I thought of a, the embryo here. You see these little bead-like structures, which we call somites. They are beginning of what will be the vertebrae or the backbone. And uh, I suggested that this chewed stage uh, could be uh, re refer referring to these uh, uh, somites, which have the appearance of... Uh, of a chewed substance. If you take, as I did at that time, took a piece of gum and, and bit into it and you're left with these teeth marks which look very much uh, like this. So uh, this stage, the mudga stage, occurs at about 26 to 27 days and we call that the somite period in uh, descriptive embryology. Uh, the transformation from the alica to the mudga is very rapid and during the last day or two of the alica stage, the embryo is beginning to develop some of the characteristics of the mudga, that is, the somites begin to appear. The word mudga means a piece of substance which has been chewed and uh, is used to describe this next phase of embryonic development. It uh, should apply uh, with the shape of a substance that the teeth have chewed. In fact, the appropriateness of this term mudga has been indicated in modern embryology. It has been termed that after the formation of the embryo and the placenta, this stage, the embryo receives its nutrients and energy, thereby rapidly increasing the growth process. The bodily masses, called somites, from which the bones and the muscle will form, start to appear. During the multitude of bead-like structures, or, or somites, that are present, the embryo has the appearance of a substance that had been, had been imprinted by teeth. The processes of this period can be recognized in the following points. First, the appearance of the somites, or the imprints, changes constantly. And just as the teeth imprints change on a substance with each act of chewing, the embryo changes its overall shape, but the structure derived from the somites remain. And secondly, the embryo turns in its position due to the modifications in its uh, center of gravity with the new tissue formation, similar to the turning of a substance with chewing. And third, just as a chewed substance becomes curled before being swallowed, so does the back of the embryo become curved. And four, as the somites form, the internal features of the embryo in the mudga stage are partly differentiated into organ onlaga, that means the beginning of structures, and partly undifferentiated. And this uh, description is also uh, stated in the Quran. Now, this is an, a later stage of mudga. You can see the uh, tail that we all had at that stage. And this little uh, flipper-like structure is what's going to be your, your upper limb. Uh, and so uh, th this is the uh, mudga stage. The next slide. Uh, then out of the chewed-like substance, uh, partly differentiated and partly undifferentiated. And when I was asked what this uh, uh, sort of meant, or, well, I said it's clear to me that an embryo at that stage uh, is only partly differentiated. In other words, some of the organs, like the early development of the eye and the ear and the heart, some parts are well differentiated, others are poorly differentiated, and some are uh, undifferentiated. And so we have the, this mixture which agrees exactly uh, with this uh, uh, dictor uh, syrup. Thus the term mudga is very meaningful. 
since the embryo is a lump of irregularly shaped tissue at this stage and a creation of systems is occurring while the overall process is incomplete. Some of the organs will form in the mudga stage and some will form in later stages. Now the next stage is called the Izam stage. This subsequent stage, uh, phase of development, is referred to as Izam, which means bones. And the fetus does indeed acquire a, a cartilaginous skeleton after the mudga stage. Those of you that have studied embryology realize that, first of all, you have what we call mesenchymal bones made out of connective tissue, then they become cartilaginous, and then they become uh, ossified and become uh, bones, solid bones. The formation of the bone does not begin uniformly throughout the body. Rather, there is a sequen sequential appearance of bony tissue. In recent decades, the process of osteogenesis in the human embryo has been reasonably well documented. Bone development in the limb limbs commences in the embryonic limb buds from these mesenchymal or connective tissue cells. Primary ossification centers appear in the femur during the fifth week, the femur is your thigh bone, uh, and in the sternum, it's breastbone, and the maxilla, jaw, during eight to nine weeks. The timing of the exam phase has been mentioned in the following hadith. He simply show these various stages when at this stage the bones in the limb would be cartilaginous. The same here, you're starting to get little uh, indications of the uh, bones uh, developing. And then this hadith says, when 42 nights have passed from the time of the nutva, that is the time of conception, Allah sends an angel to it who shapes it and makes its ears, eyes, skin, muscles, and bones. In the early phase, part of this phase, the embryo takes on a human appearance, Tazwir Adami, and the Hadith describes this with the word shapes. Before the 42nd day, it is difficult to, to distinguish the human embryo from the embryos of many animals, but at this stage it becomes clearly distinguishable in its appearance. Uh, I couldn't tell a mouse embryo from a human embryo or a rabbit embryo in those very early stages. So as this hadith is making clear is that after this uh, 40th day, when uh, the angel uh, sends an angel to it, with shapes it and so on, that it takes on its human characteristics. <laughs> Accompanying this development is a straightening of the embryo described by the word sawa. During this period, the embryo becomes more erect and acquires a more evenly rounded body. Some of the generalized cells of the embryo begin to differentiate into various lines and modify into different functional moieties. This process results in straightening and the formation of organs necessary for viability. As the Quran describes, when God created you, then, and the word fa means then, made you even and straight, sawak. And then fa, again, modified you, adalak, and uh, so on. According to uh, the table, and is that on the slide, the table? Showing the different stages. Here's the, here's the table which you're referring to. You can see these stages listed the uh, along the side here, and uh, you have the shaping stage, and, and so on. These are all correlated with the age and days, and the uh, actual size of the uh, embryo. According to this uh, table, which compares the three ayat on the stages of development, it is apparent that the Izam stage corresponds with the straightening stage, Taswiya, the word sawak in the Quranic statement indicates the following. First, to straighten the position of the body from a bent position and to also to make uneven things leveled. The embryo at the seventh week has a bent back, thus taking the shape of the letter C during the mudga stage. In the Izam stage, the bending position is straightened and the surface becomes more even due to the disappearance of prominences and depressions. Now the LAM stage, although precursor cells, which we call myoblasts or early muscle cells, are present 
adjacent to the developing bones, differentiation into skeletal muscle attachments appears after the ossification process in the shaft and the ends of the bones. I was asked many times, did the bones bef appear before the muscles? Well, they certainly do. If you want to be logical about it, you wouldn't have muscles until you had something to attach them to. So you have bones and then the muscles. And this is clearly uh, stated in the Quran that the bones appear first. A major developmental landmark during the eighth week is the LAM stage, which describes the myogenesis, that is the formation of muscles, uh, which marks the development of the definitive muscles in the trunk and the limbs and the beginning of movement. The muscles take their position around the bones, that is clothing the bones, and continue the process of straightening and smoothing, taswiya. In other words, as the muscles develop, they straighten the embryo up, which uh, the straightening and smoothing which began in the Izam stage. It is now known that the gonads, that is the developing sex glands, differentiate into testes and ovaries at this time, that is during the eighth week. And the Quran refers to this development as well. Now the growth stage, or the nasha stage, uh, the long stage represents the end of the embryonic period. Uh, we say that the embryonic period uh, ends at the end of the eighth week, and then it becomes the fetal period. So here in this terminology, the long stage represents the end of the embryonic period, in other words, the end of the eighth week, during which much of the organogenesis or the development of the organ occurs. The Quran uses the word... How do we pronounce that? Halanga? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Which is translated means made or changed. Okay. In referring to all the embryonic stages. Kalakna, is that how we say it? <laughs> I can't get my tongue around that one. Kalakna. Kalakna, okay. Indicates that the new organized tissues are being formed in these stages. However, with the ninth week, the period of fetal development, Hasha, Nasha, begins. The Quran clearly distinguishes the beginning of this period by using the word Ashanu Nafu in the following statement. Then we, Anasha Nafu, cause him to grow and come into being and attain the definitive human form. Anasha Nahu means to initiate, to grow and develop, and to rise and increase. The interpreters of the Quran uh, understood the following meanings for the Quranic passage. Development of the fetus into a creature capable of speaking, hearing, and seeing, breathing the spirit into the fetus, and finding the characteristics of the Nasha stage. The following characteristics of the Nasa stage are rapid growth and development and this uh, again this chart is from my book as you can see in the early stages the uh, ninth week twelfth and so on there's very little uh, growth occurring there uh, the organs are developing rapidly and then as you see from from on from the twelfth week on there's very rapid development and these uh, uh, fetuses are drawn to exact scale so that uh, you can see that the, the development is, is, is very rapid. So it's a period of rapid growth and development which directly applies with the meaning of Nasha as explained. Directly after the Lam stage, that is the ninth week, until the twelfth week, the fetus grows slowly and then the growth becomes very rapid. There's also a change in the nature of the fetus and the development of, of its organs. The skeleton develops from soft cartilaginous bones to more solid calcified bones, and by the time of 12 weeks gestation, centers of ossification are present in most bones. The limbs become differentiated, and nails can be detected on the fingers and toes. The proportional sizes of the head, body, and limbs change, and their relative proportions become more balanced, particularly between the ninth and 12th weeks. Lanugo hair, that's very fine hair that uh, the fetuses have and newborn babies have the same. The proportional size of the head and the body and the limbs change and uh, this hair appears on the skin which is fully differentiated uh, into the epidermis and hypodermis by the twelfth week. The external genitalia become begin to differentiate in the ninth week and also the testes begin their descent and the internal genitalia uh, develop. 
At this stage in the twelfth week, a male fetus can be distinguished from a female on the basis of its external genitalia. Voluntary and smooth musculature, musculature are established. Fetuses at this stage of development reveal or mimic spontaneous movements, and reflex muscular contractions can be elicited by an external stimulus. In general, the overall physiological development of the nervous system parallels the maturation of the brain and the spinal cord. Primitive and instinctive responses, such as sucking and grasping, are subcortical functions and appear much later. Nevertheless, this stage of development represents an important transitional landmark for the fetus because it is reasonably well-coordinated reflexes and movements which can be progressively vigorous in time. And I should say that we can study these stages very easily now in, in, in developing humans because with the techniques of ultrasound and also fetoscopy, you can actually watch these uh, fetuses uh, moving and you can see that some of them will even begin to suck their thumbs before they're born. Other delicate and subtle developments occur in the fetus, which has changed from its first creation, the embryo, to another one, the fetus, as the Quran has described. The third point is that there's extensive and continued development of organ systems. The embryonic period, which ends with the LAM stage, is characterized by the gradual appearance of organs. The fetal period, which follows, is characterized by the preparation of the organ systems to perform their functions, because as soon as the baby is born, it must be able to breathe on its own, it must be able to, uh, its heart must be able to circulate, and uh, all the other uh, organs uh, have to uh, uh, be functional. The fetal period, which follows, is characterized then by the preparation of these organ systems to perform their functions. As the interpreters mentioned, this is the meaning of the Quranic phrase, come into being and attain the definitive form, that is, the human form. And thus the fetus is made into a creature capable of speaking, hearing, and seeing. The fourth part is the acquisition of a soul, and according to the Islamic information, the soul comes to the embryo sometime after the 40 to the 45 days in development, as mentioned in the Hadith related by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, the truthful and trusted, told us, in every one of you, all components of your creation are collected together in your mother's womb by 40 days. And in that is an alaka like that. Then is a mudka like that. Then God sends an angel ordered with four instructions. He's told to record his, the human being now developing, deeds his provision, future benefits, whether he will be miserable or happy, and then the spirit is breathed into him, that is, the soul is acquired. The Hadith indicates that there is some delay after the seventh week, according to the use of the word thuma. Embryological studies have not determined the acquisition of a soul to which the Quranic commentators referred. The nature of the soul is generally outside the realm of experimental science and is essentially unknown at this time to uh, mankind. As God says in the Quran, they ask thee concerning the spirit. Say the spirit comes by command of my Lord. Of knowledge it is only a little that is communicated to you, O men. However, what do we know? However, what we do know is that there is a difference between life and the soul, although the nature of both is a mystery. A creature, a creature with a soul has self-awareness. On the other hand, the sperm and the ovum are alive, since without life they would be unable to participate in fertilization. When the fetus is capable of moving voluntarily from his or her own desire, as opposed to moving reflexly, this could be taken as evidence that, is, that he has acquired a soul. During the tenth week of development, for example, the fetus exhibits spontaneous movements and moves in response to stimuli. While these movements may reflect primitive neurological refl reflexes and do not present conclusive evidence of the presence of a soul, they do indicate that the soul is probably acquired near this time, and this would be in agreement with the time frame presented in the Islamic statements. Now, the word, the word uh, ansha nahu, as it is used in the Quran, covers the most apparent external and internal developments and changes in features in this stage of human development. The three meanings given for nasha comprehensively apply to this stage. 
to initiate applies with the initiation of the functioning of various organ systems. For example, the kidneys begin to form urine, blood cells begin to form in the bone marrow, and the hair follicles first appear in the tenth week, and so on, to grow and develop. Applies with the rapid growth and the extensive development of all the organ systems of the body, which occurs during this stage. And to rise and increase applies with the very a uh, rapid increase beginning in the twelfth week in the length and the weight of the fetus. Therefore, the term nasha appropriately and accurately applies to the fetal period of development. And, and number seven, the timing of the developmental events. Not only is the sequencing of the embryonic and fetal developments indicated by the order in which they are mentioned in the Quran, but also the timing of these events is indicated by the use of the conjunctive spa, which means then, with a little delay, and thuma, which means then with some delay. The occurrences afa and thuma, both of which are translated as then, are as follows. We, God, created man from a quintessence of clay. We then, thuma, placed him as a nutfa, a drop, in a place of settlement, firmly fixed. Then, thuma, we made the nutfa into an alaka, leech-like structure, and then, fa, we changed the alaka into a mudga, chewed-like substance, and then, fa, we uh, made out of that mudga izam, or skeleton or bones, then, fa, we clothed the skeleton with lam, muscles and flesh, then, thuma, we caused him to grow and come into being and attain the definitive form, human form. So blessed be God, the best uh, to create. The use of Thuma then indicates that there is a delay between the following events. First, the Nutva stage developing into the Alaka, first stage of the shaping stage, Lam, the last stage of the shaping, Kaluk stage, until the development of Nasha, the fetal period. During the implantation or hearth phase of the Nutva stage, there is a slow rate of development until the uh, Alaka stage takes about a week from the beginning of the hearth, that is the day six, uh, for the connecting stock to form, day 14, such as the embryo becomes attached and hanging. And it takes about 10 days for the notochord to begin development on the day 16 in order for the embryo to take on the appearance of a leech or an alica. Thus there is some delay in the formation of the alica stage. A lot of this is related to uh, it uh, developing blood vessels to inquire, to uh, acquire nourishment from the mother. The nasha or fetal stage can be considered as being in the ninth week, but is delayed in the expression of all its characteristics until later. For example, the, peri the period between the beginning of the ninth week and the end of the eleventh week is a period of relatively slow growth, and it is not until the twelfth week that the rapid growth indicated by anasha nahu begins. Additionally, the initiation of development of certain organ systems occurs after the eighth week or after the LAM stage. But the changes in these organs become more apparent after the eleventh week. Thus there is a delay until the twelfth week for the full expression of nasha, and the word thuma accurately indicates this delay. The word fa indicates that the following stages occur directly after one another, alaka changing to mudga, Mudga changing to Azam, Azam changing to Lam. The embryo of 24 to 25 days is the end of the Alaka stage, and it makes a direct change into the Mudga stage at 26 to 27 days. The Mudga stage lasts until the sixth week, and then changes directly into the Azam by the beginning of the seventh week, since the skeleton begins its appearance at that time. The Lam stage follows in the eighth week, immediately after the Zan stage, since the muscle precursor cells begin their development in the muscle as soon as the bone is formed and the muscles can come, become attached. Thus the word uh, fa is uh, used in the Quran to accurately and strongly indicate that these developments follow one another immediately with no delay. And now the conclusions of this uh, study are that the terms which have been used in the Quran are very descriptive of development developments which occur in the various stages, and they describe these events in their chronological order. Morphological changes that occur with development in each stage are also accurately described by the use of these terms. 
Because the staging of human embryos is complex, going through a continuous process of change during development, it is proposed that a new system of classification could be developed using the terms mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. The proposed system is simple, comprehensive, and conforms with present embryological knowledge. The facts about human development that could not have been known by Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the seventh century, because most of them were not discovered until the twentieth century. Muslims and others are justified in concluding that these facts could only have been revealed to Muhammad, peace be upon him, by God, who knows all about us, not only about who, how we develop, but how we live and function. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moore. <clears throat> I believe, as a listener, that Dr. Moore has given us the best abridgment, best possible abridgment, between the physical and the metaphysical, the spiritual and the physical, do really meet. I came to this conclusion, and I promise you that you might change your minds about the possibility of having relationship between religion and science. Now, uh, to further our understanding about the subject, we open the uh, questions and answers for Dr. Moore. You would like to... Oh, yeah. Your time. I know you're young, but... <laughs> <laughs> I ex well, uh, you, can, you can ask me any question you like. The creation of embryology, what the Quran has mentioned, um, when were you first notified and uh, after the fact, you have seen, how did it affect you in your personal life? And another question follow that, have you become Muslim or have you accepted Islam? Why and why not? Thank you. That's the question I've been asked, of course, <laughs> hundreds of times, and I, it's a very logical question. And I'll give you the same answer that I gave in Saudi Arabia, that I gave in Toronto, that I gave in Sudbury a couple of weeks ago, and that I give anywhere I go. And that is that I was raised in a Christian family. My father was a, was a Presbyterian minister, uh, and uh, he uh, taught me to respect all religions, and uh, he... Uh, said that all those who believe and worship God uh, just have a different way of doing it. So I have no difficulty uh, in uh, understanding that we, we all worship the same God. Now, it would be different if I didn't have a strong faith of my own. In other words, if I had uh, been a, a, an agnostic and didn't believe strongly in God, that obviously I would have ex probably accepted your religion. But as I was raised and uh, as a, a Christian and, and, and believe, as you do, that uh, uh, Muhammad was a, was a messenger of God, just as Jesus was a messenger, uh, each bringing messages from God. So I didn't find it difficult when I was told about the Quran and that these were revelations from, my God, uh, from God. It, didn't, uh, it wasn't difficult for me because my own father made it very clear to me that he was uh, called by God to be uh, uh, a minister to go and, and, and talk about God uh, to the, the people. So uh, in an indirect way, maybe God is telling me that this is the right thing for me to do to uh, help uh, explain your holy book uh, to you. Now, uh, your scientific colleagues can do this just as well as I can if they have an understanding of embryology. But I've always said that it's uh, probably mean more uh, as a non-Muslim for me to tell people around the world that I believe that what is recorded in the Quran is accurate according to our present knowledge. And uh, as I say, I'm sincere in what I say is that we just didn't have this knowledge and some of this knowledge about the genes and the chromosomes has only come to us in the last uh, 10 and 15 years. When I was a student uh, 25 or 30 years ago, we didn't have a lot of the knowledge we have now. And there are a lot of things in the Quran that were, uh, I was asked questions about, and I said, I don't understand it. And I think that maybe in another hundred years, and I won't be here, but some of those verses, if you ask them to the embryologists of that day, they will say, sure, that is what this means. So that, to answer your question very simply, I don't feel it's necessary for me to become a Muslim to uh, worship God. I've done that for all of my 60 years. 
And uh, if anything, though, uh, understanding this just uh, shows me that uh, God uh, has a, a great influence in this, uh, in, in this uh, world. That, that, that's the best that I can answer that for you. Uh, and uh, I have seen some of my colleagues who've been so impressed by what they have uh, read in the Quran and so on that they have certainly, uh, there have been a few cases where they have converted, and that's fine. And uh, if I'm ever so motivated, I would do the same. But I've been, I have a strong uh, belief. Uh, it just happens to be a, a little different way of worshiping God than yours, but uh, we're all worshiping the same God, I like to think, and that if we can work together, we'll have a much happier world. Thank you. I understand that it is during the tenth week um, when the soul is present in the embryo. Would this mean then that um, the termination of pregnancy is haram or forbidden only when done during this, during or after these periods, or is there such thing as a degree of haram depending on when abortion is done? Uh, in, in cases where we uh, detect severe chromosomal abnormalities, and you can detect this now at about six weeks, I think it was early, because you can do what we call chorionic villi sampling, those little villi that you saw in there. You can go in and with a special instrument, you can pull off some of these chorionic villi, and you can culture them, and you can determine if they are uh, have severe chromosomal abnormalities. And if they do have that, uh, you can determine then that they have no chance of survival. If they have, for example, what we call trisomy 13, where they have an extra 13 chromosome, or they have trisomy 18, another 18 chromosome, those children cannot possibly survive. And there are those who see nothing wrong if you detect that, say, at five or six weeks of then inducing uh, an abortion. Uh, I personally don't have any difficulty with that when, when, when it's done very early. That is uh, sort of six, seven weeks. Uh, but I certainly have uh, strong feelings about abortions that are done even as late as uh, 13 uh, and 14 weeks, which is the common uh, common time. In Japan, they're at the present time able to abort up to 24 weeks, which, as you know, is a viable fetus. And I, I find that just unacceptable. In fact, I had an interview with uh, a newspaper reporter, and he wanted to know my view, and I didn't. I told him very clearly that I thought this was was wrong, and they're thinking of changing their law. Uh, to bring it back to 20 weeks, I still think that is uh, is too too li too late uh, in pregnancy. But I think that uh, I don't know exactly what the Muslim view would. But my feeling is that if uh, if the, it was aborted uh, in those early very early stages before it developed a soul, as they would say, then then it it might be considered all right. But again, these things are personal decisions which people have to make on the basis of the discussions with their with their doctor and with their uh, religious uh, people to determine it. And uh, my students always ask me, what would you have done? Well, fortunately, I never had that problem. We had five normal children. And, uh, but how could, how that's a hypothetical question. But I can often say that knowing what I know now, I don't think that uh, either of us would have uh, uh, considered that the right thing to do. It's a very personal thing. And, uh, my, my own children happen to feel uh, the same way. I don't know why. Maybe it's my influence, I hope. I would like to know from Dr. Moore, um, how close the other biblical scriptures or any other religious books, how close do they get to this issue of human reproduction? Uh, again, I'm... I'm uh, not uh, completely familiar with the Old and the New T Testament, which uh, I probably should be, uh, although I certainly read it a lot when I was a young person. But I have uh, my friends, uh, in fact, one of my nephews who's a clergyman, and he's assured me that there's nothing in the Old or the New Testament uh, other than vague uh, references, but nothing uh, close to what we have here. Uh, because I have put this in both of my embryology books, which are used around the world, the bigger book is in seven languages legally and one illegally. Uh, they're, so they're used around the world. I get letters from people saying uh, this is. Uh, there are these references in in our holy books too. And those of you who have seen the latest edition, in fairness, I did quote from uh, uh, the, the uh, Hindu 
religion where they make some statements about early development. But again, it's back uh, similar to what uh, the early views we had in the, in the 15th and 16th century. So uh, I think that uh, through my contacts, everyone has scanned their own holy books, and I can assure you that if there was anything there that was as good or better, they would be telling me about it because they would want to get international recognition for it. Uh, so uh, I have been asked why I put that information in my historical section. I said, well, I think it's a part of the history of embryology, and although it's been lost to most people for years, I think it's important that it be recorded there. Uh, for those of you that wish more information on this, there is an Islamic edition of, oh, it's really a, an English edition of my book with Islamic editions. My publisher agreed to allow King Abdulaziz University to print this special edition, uh, but it cannot be sold because, of course, they don't, they don't, uh, want it sold in competition to the regular English edition. But uh, I think that uh, Sheikh uh, Mustafa Ahmed could uh, arrange for you to get uh, copies of this edition for, for your libraries. In other words, it's not, you can't purchase it, I understand it, in a regular bookstore, but if you need it for your Muslim libraries, uh, you can uh, purchase this. That was the arrangement that was made with my, uh, my publisher. Uh, and uh, that goes into all the details and many more than, uh, than we've had time to talk about here today. Thank, I would like to thank everybody for uh, being patient and being a uh, good listener. And I uh, knew I would like to thank the MSA for uh, uh, hosting this and the University of Illinois for hosting this meeting and making it possible.